Hello, and welcome to the first public presentation of the Lake Eola Master Plan. This is a conceptual master plan where we've had several partners helping us uh, come to this point. My name is John Perone. I am the City of Orlando Parks Division Manager, and with me today from the city is Mercedes Blanca with Downtown Development Board, Susan Harris with Communications, Chris Wallace is the Cultural Arts Manager, Quincy Richards Richardson is the Lake Eola Park Manager, and Tara Rusikoff, she's the Marketing and Communications Coordinator for the City of Orlando. So welcome to all of you. And now I would like to introduce you to Frank Bellamo. He's with GAI and the main consultant on this project. Thank you, John. Welcome everyone. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. Um, as John said, I am Frank Bellamo. I'm the Senior Director of Landscape Architecture at GAI Consultants Community Solutions Group. We take a minute to introduce the folks on the design team that are with us today and that you'll be hearing from. Uh, Donald Wishart is a director and a landscape architect in uh, our community solutions group. Sheba West is a landscape architect, a community design manager, and is serving as the project manager on this project. And then one of our really truly trusted partners is Max Brito. Max is with Rhodes and Brito Architects, and you'll see and you'll hear from Max, but you're also going to see examples of the proposed architectural components of the project here in just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to remind everyone that the presentation is being recorded is going to be posted on the project website. And this project does have a website. It is orlando.gov forward slash EOLA plan. So please feel free to go to that for any information um, that would be posted to it and updates. You can also obviously see this presentation again. And maybe more importantly, tell friends and family that didn't have an opportunity to join us today that they can go to the website and see this presentation. If we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, um, before we get into it, messages from Mayor Dyer and Commissioner Sheehan and Hill. Thank you, Sheba. Lake Eola Park has been a signature park for our city for many years. Over the years, the park has featured a zoo, a racetrack, tennis courts, mock sea battles, and many other attractions. Of course, today we see a different park, visited by more than 3 million people each year. It's home to swans, a beautiful fountain, and big events like fireworks at the Fountain on 4th of July, and small events like Sunday yoga in the park. We expect more changes as Orlando continues to grow, but we hope one thing stays the same, your passion for the park and the heart of our downtown. Thank you for taking the time to be involved in the future of Lake Hill Park, by attending this meeting and completing our survey. Please also encourage your friends and neighbors to also give us some feedback. We want to know what's important to you as we shape the future for our iconic park. I look forward to seeing what the future holds. Have a great night. Hi, I'm Commissioner Patty Sheehan. Thank you for attending the meeting for the Lake Eola Park Conceptual Master Plan presentation. Lake Eola is our signature park and your input is important. We want to make sure that everyone in Orlando can enjoy Lake Eola Park for years to come. Hi, I'm Commissioner Regina Hill, District 5. Welcome to the Lake Eola Park Conceptual Master Plan meeting. We're so glad you could join us. Lake Yola Park hosts millions of visitors each year. This is a chance for us to determine what physical changes are needed to serve both residents and visitors as Orlando continues to grow. Contractors have gathered information from a series of public meetings, as well as thousands of surveys from throughout the city. We appreciate your input as we envision how Lake Yola Park will look sound and feel in the next 50 years. Excellent. Um, so before we before I get into the agenda, I just want to remind everyone if you didn't see the message at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of your screen, there are several buttons, one of which is Q&A. So anytime during this presentation, if you click on that, if you've got a question, you can you can ask it. And then we're going to reserve about 30 minutes at the end of the presentation today to answer as many of those questions as we can. So it's the Q&A button, um, not the chat button, but the Q&A. So I appreciate that. OK, so our agenda for today, I'm going to talk for a minute here in just a second about our process so you know sort of where we've been and where we're headed. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Donald. He's going to talk about the guiding principles of the overall design of the master plan. And then he'll get into the details of the design overview 
we'll have a number of enlargements of the plan so you can see a little bit more detail. And then again, as I mentioned, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So the process that we have embarked on, it really our master plan process is, uh, takes place in three steps. The first step we call the foundation. This is really where we do two things. We're gonna, we analyze the park. Um, we looked at the park in terms of the context of its context within the downtown. So we looked at transportation systems. We looked at bike infrastructure, the adjoining neighborhoods, any new development that is gonna be coming online to see if there was an impact or would be an impact on the future of the park. We looked at downtown hydrology, other downtown parks, and a couple of other uh, issues as well that were important for us to understand. Um, we also did a pretty deep dive on analyzing the site itself. We looked at what are being utilized now as the main entry points. We looked at the sidewalk network, adjoining roadways. The architecture was very important for us to analyze. A variety of activity zones, the, the overall ecology of the park. And all of this was really just to get a really deep understanding of the place. But the second part of the foundation was equally important is about gathering as much information as we can from folks like you to understand um, what it is that you want to see in a future Eola Park. So we did a couple of things. We had um, what we call stakeholder inter interviews. These are small group interviews. We talked to homeowners association presidents we talked to condo association presidents and property managers. We talked to most of the directors of the Main Street programs uh, throughout the city. We had a really productive meeting with uh, coordinators of some of the special events within the park to understand um, what their issues are, any problems that they're having, what works well. So we had those interviews um, with those stakeholders. We've met uh, a couple of times with a steering committee uh, made up of individuals from a variety of departments within the city so they can inform us of any future plans uh, as they reviewed the design as it was progressing. So that was very helpful for us. And finally, we met with you all, with the public, and we had a very early public kickoff meeting where um, we outlined the process that we were going to be embarking upon we sent everybody hopefully to the to the website. There is a survey there. We got over 2,800 responses, which was fabulous. And then in November, we held three open public meetings, different days of the week and different times to get the maximum participation that we could. Um, those of you that attended, and I'm assuming some of you are on this in this meeting as well. If you recall, you participated in exercises that helped us to understand what your needs and desires were for the park. So the foundation really is complete. We are now coming to the end of step two, which we call exploring. And really since around December, we've been embarking on this design process and, and, and you'll see that here in just, uh, just a couple of seconds. Um, we'll take your comments today and we will, um, anything that is gonna require a modification to the plan, we will go ahead and make that. And so sometime during the summer of this year coming up, we will uh, finalize the plan and present it again at another public meeting. That is the final step, which we call the vision. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Donald and uh, Donald is gonna talk about the guiding principles and then introduce the design of the park. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to be working on this. I've worked very closely with Frank and Sheba and Andrea in the development of this plan. And we, we've worked very closely with the city and we appreciate all the stakeholder involvement. We had, like Frank said, we had a tremendous amount of public input throughout the initial part of this project. And we wanted to actually document that in this diagram. And yeah, I think you can probably read the guiding principles on the side of this, but we want to distill some of the input that we had down to a few kind of high level ideas. And that idea behind guiding principles is that, you know, as we develop through the concept plan and into the final plan, these become checkpoints for us to kind of, as we kind of think about ideas and test ideas, you know, we come back to these guiding principles to find out if we're actually staying on track, are we living true to some of the input and the, and the guidance that we receive from the city and the stakeholders. So just to touch on these briefly, sustainability, and I know sustainability is a very broad term. It applies in, in many different ways to this plan. It can, it is everything to do with the ecology of the lake, the plant selection, how do we think about materiality? How do we think about the advancement of technology into the future? And, and then also actually kind of, you know, how do we use and maintain the park every day? Because there's a tremendous amount of inputs that go to the, 
to the maintenance of the park every day. So sustainability is a big term, but I think it's a, it's a good one kind of at the top that kind of overlays everything we think about in the park. In terms of authenticity, you know, we, we've got a lot of feedback from the public that we wanted to be true to what I would call the bones of Lake Eola. It's a tremendous park. It's really served the community well over time. I think um, we got a lot of feedback that we didn't, as we thought about advancing the program and maybe introducing new program, that we, did, we wanted that to be authentic to Orlando and authentic to the, the history of the park without that being too themey. So we definitely wanted to kind of steer clear of any kind of themed um, elements within the park. And then livability and emerging city. I, I actually kind of think of those two together. Uh, you know, as we continue to urbanize and grow and the population grows, there's going to just be more and more demand on the park. And I think you can see that anybody who's, who used the park today can tell that it's, it's you know, it has a little bit of wear and tear. There's a tremendous amount of use of the park. So you know, with this with this look at the park, we wanted to think about, you know, as we continue to urbanize, urbanize this park is going to become more and more precious and get more and more pressure on it. So how do we think about elevating a little bit of the program that we have today, but maybe introducing new program that makes it the, this, um, you know, kind of a livable place for the city of Orlando. And then emerging city, you know, to be what we call kind of future ready. How do we think about the technology overlay to the park? You know, be that solar um, energy, charging stations, augmented reality in terms of how we think about um, interpretive elements within the park. It really is a pretty broad category as well, but it really starts to infuse and inform us, you know, as we think about how to advance program within the park. Chiba, you can go to the next slide. So the way we're going to tackle this, it's a big plan. It takes kind of a, a little bit of, to get through the details of the plan. We've put a lot of thought into this and we're excited about sharing it with you, but we're going to kind of just take, your, take you through the plan kind of counterclockwise. We really kind of focused in on what we call activity nodes. So for, for most of you, you know that those are the areas within the park that get the most, the most activity, kind of the most program, where, where you actually probably spend most of your time. We're gonna talk about the lake edge, the ecology of the lake, the promenade around the lake, which is really one of the biggest draws. And even out to the perimeter, as we talk, start to think about the streets, the streets are very much a part of the park, how you arrive at the park, how you enter into the park, how you experience the park. So we have some pretty detailed thoughts on those as well, in particular on Eola Drive. So let's, we wanna start through some of these enlargements. And I'm gonna to touch on the common area elements and then Max is gonna jump in. So we're gonna be going back and forth a little bit on between the common area and the architectural elements, but of course, you know, the, the plaza on the west side adjacent to the CBD is one of the biggest activity nodes. Of course, it's home to the, to the amphitheater. Um, we really, for the most part, this part of the plan kind of stays intact, but we know that plaza gets a lot of use during the holidays. It gets a lot of use in terms of pre and post function for events at the amphitheater. It really just needed expanding. So we've expanded it toward the lake and to the, to the south to probably 50% larger than it is today. We've, keep, we've kept the feature palms. We've introduced a water feature on Rosalind to help kind of buffer that sound from the street. We've, on, the, on the east side, we've actually let that terrace down. So there's kind of a gentle eroding edge that gets you down closer to the water in a little bit more graceful way. And then in terms of circulation, as most of you probably know, the circulation today goes through the kind of upper level of the seating of the amphitheater. We wanted to simplify that. So one of our big moves is to take the promenade on the north side and actually swing that around the east and um, create a new promenade piece around the backside of the amphitheater. It really is a, it's, we've been out there, we've experienced that. It, it creates kind of a tremendous open view to the lake that no one has today. We've widened that promenade out to about 30 feet so that it gives you kind of an expansion of the plaza, but it also takes that circulation out of the core of the amphitheater. We have a smaller branch that takes you over to Roslyn. So it's very easy to circulate and navigate around the amphitheater. But what that does is creates kind of a, a secure, controllable envelope around the amphitheater. So when they do have events, you don't have that kind of cross circulation going on during, during the event itself. And as far as kind of big ideas with the amphitheater, our, our thought is that we would keep the core of the amphitheater kind of intact, but we really received a lot of input about needing more seating, needed more shaded seating, um, you know, the performers on the stage often have an issue with sun and glare and the heat. So our thought was to actually expand the seating area to the west with what I call kind of an outfield. It would be a turf area, be much more casual seating, 
Mac, Max will talk in a second about a cantilevered shade structure over that upper level seating um, that would really make that much more functional and much more comfortable and actually kind of buffer the, and the sounds coming from the central business district. And the piece over the stage is really gonna kind of partially shade the audience, but mostly kind of shade the stage and get some of that solar protection and just make that more comfortable overall. So it's a it's an overlay to the amphitheater, but I think you'll see in some of the images that Max is going to go through that it, the, the iconic image of the amphitheater still kind of lives on. Max, you can go ahead, Shiva, to the next slide. Bye. Thank you, Donald. Appreciate it. Um, I, like Donald said, I'm Max Brito, Rosa Brito Architects. Um, we are very proud to be part of this project. Lake Eola means a lot to me and my firm. Our office is actually on the edge of Lake Eola, so we see it every day. I was just out earlier taking a walk around the lake. Uh, so it, it really means a lot to us, and we have really are really invested in the design and trying to be good stewards over where this lake is or where this park is going to go in the future. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to go through a lot of the architecture that we're planning for the park. I'm going to start with the amphitheater and some of the uh, enhancements uh, we're looking at doing there. And so this view is if you were standing in the uh, plaza just south of the, uh, of the band shell looking back towards the facility. And the first thing you notice is a very large canopy that goes over the uh, western edge and kind of covers the uh, stage and, and a good portion of the seating. So that cover is really a functional response to a uh, operational issue. So typically when you design a uh, outdoor amphitheater, you, you really wanna have the stage oriented to the uh, north. That way you don't get all the direct sunlight coming into the eyes of the performers where they're putting on a show. It's very difficult to be on the stage trying to connect with the audience if you can't really see them because the sun is obstructing your views. Um, so that's why you see that there. Uh, there is another canopy that's on the western edge uh, towards the back. Uh, that's the canopy that's, you know, giving cover to the new grass seating. And as Donald said, it does increase the capacity of the facility very nicely. And we think that's going to be a very uh, a good added um, benefit uh, to this facility. And you'll also notice how the circulation now moves around um, the uh, amphitheater and the backside of the stage. Uh, we think that is really going to set this thing apart. And you'll see in some of the uh, other images how that starts to set up. But before I go too far, we also want to uh, recommend some updates to the actual band shell. Nothing that's going to change the aesthetics of the facility. It just needs the, some refurbishment. Uh, definitely paint it. Um, some of the wall um, material needs to be updated and, uh, and fixed. And definitely the inside where the green room and the restroom, all that needs to be uh, up to date and brought, brought up to um, code. Um, the cover that we're putting in over the stage also provides ample area uh, for additional lighting and audio visual. And again, you'll see that as we move forward. You can go to the next slide. So this is if you're on the north side of the lake looking south, and you can see the uh, circulation moving around the east and the west of the amphitheater. Uh, I like that because now the theater becomes a little more intimate. You don't have cross circulation running through the uh, seating and uh, disrupting what's going on inside the facility. You start to see the scale of the canopies and how they react uh, to the band shell itself and also how the whole facility reacts to the backdrop of the city. And you can see how, how nicely it all fits in scale. It actually feels like it belongs there. And um, so, you know, again, this is really kind of taking it to the next level. You can go to the next slide. So if you're actually sitting over on the grassy knoll looking at a uh, performance, uh, you can see how that canopy really creates a nice shaded area, not just for the seating, but also for the stage. So now you can have a performance while the sun coming directly into their eyes. And you can see how the underside of that canopy allows for additional lighting. Because currently, the majority of the lighting is back behind the performers. And you really want to have lighting out in front as well. And it also picks up additional area for more uh, audio, visual, and sound system. You can go to the next slide. 
So if you're heading north on Roslyn uh, and you look to your right or to the east, you'll see the back wall of that uh, west canopy. And the base of that wall, I think, really creates a, a great opportunity uh, for public art. And it, it can come with a lot of different guises, but you've got a nice little blank canvas there. You know, on the top, you see the canopy. Uh, the canopy is a great opportunity to add photovoltaic cells uh, to generate some of our own electricity and get it back into the grid. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a lot of different things, uh, multifunctional uses for everything that we're putting in place. You can go to the next slide. So now you start to get an idea of um, what we can do with the um, lighting and how you can actually have a show on the outside of the canopy. And that same thing can happen on the inside of the canopy. I mean, just imagine you're inside, of the, you're there to see a performance and now you can project the, um, a thunderstorm, whatever you want inside there to kind of create the ambiance for that show. Uh, we think that could be very uh, dynamic. Or, you, you know, for the most part, you won't see that. And just the band show itself really becomes uh, the show. And so as you're looking from across the lake, it becomes even more enhanced uh, with the updated lighting and uh, the new the enhanced colors that we're going to put on there. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so just to get your bearings, this is a cross section through the promenade around the back side of the amphitheater. So this is the new piece that we're proposing on the east side. It's like I said, it's a wide promenade. I think we've taken this piece out to about 30 feet. So it's very generous. It would allow, you know, ample opportunity to get out and to view the lake to, you know, pre and post function events. We want to, we want to kind of canter, cantilever the promenade so you can kind of really get out over the water and be in touch with the lake. So that's kind of a new opportunity there. We have a small planted area that will help kind of buffer the back of house of the amphitheater. You can see that we're picking up on some of that railing, just to have a little bit of separation between public and, and private with the back of the back of house for the amphitheater, picking up on the railing detail that you saw in Max's drawings um, earlier. Next slide. So just kind of making our way through the plan as we go kind of counterclockwise. So the, the Sperry Fountain is actually one of the gateways as you come from the CBD. We, we think it's a beautiful fountain. We actually just want to elevate that plaza just a little bit. So we're showing some improved paving there. We've got some statement palms to make that statement a little bit stronger with the stared entry into the plaza. It's very narrow now. So we wanted to kind of widen that out just to get a better connection to the street and to Central Boulevard. There's really no um, proper ADA access there. So we've kind of tucked in an ADA ramp um, to help kind of make that way into the park from the, from the west side. So we really like that piece and we're just kind of eleva elevating it from an area development standpoint. One of the things I wanna bring your attention to is the stormwater basin on the upper side of this. So in terms of advancing the ecology of the lake, one of the big moves that we wanna work on is just improving the overall water quality. Right now, there are about 11 outfalls into the lake for where stormwater from the surrounding streets, both downtown and the neighborhoods, is directly flowing into the lake, kind of unchecked. There's no interception of pollutants or taking any heavy metals or the oils out of that water It's going directly into the lake. So what we've proposed is, as we make our way around this plan, you'll see these darker shaded areas. Some are smaller and kind of linear, just like the one you see on the terraced area in the middle of the screen. And some are larger with these kind of oblong shapes. These are LID um, stormwater detention areas, and, and they are they will be expressed on the surface just at curb height. It's a very low profile, thin concrete wall that creates a basin that we fill with soil and fill with native plants. And all the water that's coming from those outfalls um, enters into those stormwater chambers, stages up, it gives it a chance to stage up, move slowly through that planting. It allows for plant uptake. It allows for percolation and recharge of the aquifer and allows for the soil to filter out some of the pollutants in the water. And then it also, it, it begins to catch some of the paper cups and the straws and some of the coarse material that right now is just going straight into the lake and ending up in the bottom of the lake. So those become a really nice kind of filtration system, so to speak, for all that stormwater that's, that's entering the lake. And we th really think that's gonna be a big step towards improving the overall lake um, water quality. In addition to vegetating those LID stormwater basins, we would look at also um, revegetating the entire lake edge as part of this plan. And one note here, we're, we're actually proposing 
to keep the rookery island. Um, think about how we plant that properly so it could support the bird nesting there. Perhaps uh, introduce an irrigation system that would be a wash down effect so that it would kind of be cleaner and maybe not smell as much as it does today. And, and with the stormwater basin, introduction of these stormwater basins, we're also um, have a concept of, of a side walkway that will break away from the primary promenade and create kind of a, a boardwalk edge that would allow people to get out to the lake, get closer to wildlife, get closer to the rookery. It's a great opportunity for interpretive signage and really just a, a place to kind of get in, in closer touch with the water and get off the primary promenade. And you'll, again, you'll see those kind of concept of those stormwater basins repeated along, around the lake. As you continue to the terrace seating area, we, we really like the terrace seating area on Central there. That's a, it's a very popular lunch spot. A lot of people grab lunch at Publix or we're on, the, on some of the businesses on Central and make their way out. So we've kind of kept that idea of the terrace seating, but we've simplified it. It would be concrete terrace steps that would take you down to the promenade, but then we want to continue that concept of terrace seating right down to the water's edge. So again, trying to keep, you know, give people a, a comfortable place to sit in the shade, but also allow them to get a little bit closer to the water. We've kept the upper level part of this terrace, a, a very wide green strip, because if you know Central Boulevard, there are a lot of big historic uh, oak trees there. So we want to make sure that there's enough kind of planted zone there that we don't disturb those root zones. So we're trying to maintain that upper level. And to create some shade and make these concrete terrace steps a little bit more comfortable while actually embedding canopy right into the terraces. And I think if, Chiba, if you go to the next slide, we're gonna see a cross section of what those terraces look like. We have very deliberately kind of kept this very simple um, from a design standpoint, very simple from a materiality standpoint, as opposed to all the modular block and the pavers that you see out there today that is a big maintenance issue for John and his staff. We've kept it very simple, concrete um, steps that are very easy to power wash and maintain. They're very comfortable. It's very flexible in terms of how you use them. You could have performances out on the promenade and actually use that as kind of like a mini amphitheater area. Um, like I said, the shade could come from canopy trees that we're going to embed directly into the seating zones, or perhaps we're actually entertaining the idea of large umbrellas like you see in the imagery down on the right. So those could be put up and taken down during special event times. But it was really important here for us to kind of keep the flexibility of this terrace seating, but provide the opportunity to get down and be much closer in touch with um, the lake and the wildlife that is kind of viewed through that zone. Next slide. So the southeast corner of the park, this is really one of the biggest activity nodes in the park. It's a, it's a gateway from Thornton Park, so that's important. We want to kind of elevate that from a planting standpoint and announce that with the art that's there. Um, one of our big moves here is that how we've handled the bridge at the Cove. I think one of the things that I think we all found as we walked the site was there's a beautiful Cove there with a mature uh, cypress tree canopy, but we felt like it was really overshadowed with the T-shaped bridge that you see that overlays that Cove. So we had a thought of, you know, what if we were to take that kind of top part of that T off, which is really just a shortcut across the Cove, take that bridge back to about the halfway point and let that be kind of the new um, area for the swan boat docks. We, could, we would give us much more room for the swan boat facilities to grow and expand over time because it's one of the most popular venues within the park. It would give us the ability to have a social gathering place on the head of the bridge where we have the swan wing structure that would be kind of a signature iconic shade structure over the head of the bridge. There'd be a proper ticketing booth. And with that, we feel like that gives that you know, that high level program element, kind of a place of its own within the park and an ability to grow over time as it becomes more and more popular. With, with taking down that T-straight bridge, we actually, we needed to realign the circulation. So you'll see we swung the primary promenade around the back side of the cove into the east side of the Eola house. We very deliberately kept that wide. It, it varies from about 35 to 40 feet because we know that's a big event space and we have to have the ability to set up tents through that zone. So we think that's gonna function well. It really opens up that cove and now the cove becomes part of the lake edge and exposed to the open body of the lake. On the south side of this plaza, we have the vehicular um, delivery area, which primarily functions as a delivery area off of central. Um, we think that we can kind of join that back to the east where the seating area is today to create a much larger kind of flush shared space that is much more of a kind of a pedestrian first space. You would still be able to have deliveries within that zone, 
but during bigger event days and generally day to day, that's going to feel much more like a pedestrian space. There's we introduced new canopy trees throughout this plaza where we would have you know proper dining out from the under the canopy of the more historic trees. We've actually overlaid a whole series of new tree plantings here um, to kind of think about you know, from a next generation standpoint, the, you know, the younger trees coming up and replacing some of the older tree canopy in the park. So not only will this provide kind of a functional shaded, you know, flexible plaza space, but it's actually allowing us to add much more tree canopy to the park for the future. The Ola House, with the, with the promenade swinging wide to the east, we've allowed some event space outside of it where they don't have that today um, for, you know, for pre and post functions there. We've extended Washington Street as that tongue that you see coming in from the east with the fountain that terminates that on the west side. That's a big view from Thornton Park down Washington to the fountain beyond. We want to maintain that. But I think we want to bring that up to kind of a, another kind of flush pedestrian first kind of space that could be used for a flexible space for performances. You could have food trucks in there but it really starts to work a little bit more in concert with the open space and the multi-use lawn as a, another kind of a flexible performance venue. And I think if you go to the next slide, we've illustrated this, you know, what this might look like on the, a, big, a bigger event day, like the farmer's market. You can see we've laid out the 10 by 10 tents. You can see the food trucks and the vehicular areas and the food trucks on Washington Street. We've actually um, doubled the amount of space uh, that food trucks can come in and, and set up during those events. So we feel like this not only just you know elevates the Swan Boat um, venue for the park. This kind of clarifies how people use the space. I think it kind of pulls the space together to feel more contiguous, and I think it is more comfortable both from a vendor standpoint and from a user standpoint, um, on, especially on the bigger event days. Go to the next slide. So on the east side is right now where we have the, the play area and generally there's a there's a plaza area that kind of steps down to the water. We felt like this area of the park, the east side of the park might be a little bit underutilized. Of course, you know, with, with the park plan, we're looking at new restrooms and Max is gonna touch on this one in just a minute, but um, we really wanted to use that new restroom building, which I kind of describe as much more of a pavilion, kind of a high level pavilion as the hub for the space. And we, during our public input process, we had, we had a lot of feedback that the play area was really not adequate. It was small, it was often crowded. I, you know, I lived in Eola Heights, my kids you know, are older teens now, but when they were younger, we spent a lot of time in this park and in this playground and it, inevitably it was always very crowded. So we wanted to, it's kind of the big move on this side increase the play area on the south side of this part of the plan to probably doubling that. We've got a small area for parents in that shaded zone on the upper northeast quadrant of that um, play area. So, you know, there's a comfortable place for parents to be inside that play area on the south. On the north side, we thought we could use some of that unutilized space for a new play area. Perhaps it's for older kids, you know, more contemporary play pieces, larger earth forms, uh, more, more sculptural, just a high activity zone that I think really complements what's happening on the south. And we would, and we would also propose even augmenting some of the play pieces on the south. Out in front of the pavilion, uh, we also heard we have an interactive water feature. That was another one of the pieces of the public input that we heard is that the parents really wanted to see some water within the park where kids could get in and play. You have the sound of water, you have the cooling effect of water. So we're using that as kind of a focal point out in front of the pavilion. So you can see how um, the pavilion really provides a base for this entire kind of activity play zone on the east side of the park. And you'll see a, a seating area here that really gives the parents a very commanding view of all the play and activity zones as kids kind of make their way through this, through this area. You'll see um, to the left of the plan, another LID stormwater basin. That's another opportunity for the improving the quality, the quality of the lake water and the ecology, and it's got a breakaway boardwalk, so another ability to kind of get out to that lake edge. We relocated the Swan Beach just a little bit north, because you know that's very popular. It would still have the Swan feeding stations, but you'd right off of that primary promenade, you would still be able to get to the Swan Beach, but you'd have the breakaway path to get out over the lake edge. So I think Max is gonna share uh, some, some more detail of the pavilion. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, thank you, uh, Shiva. Thank you, Donald. 
Uh, so this is one of the original um, floor plan sketches that we did of the restroom. We're going to go to another one that will go into a little more detail. But it starts to show the orientation of the, uh, the restrooms and you know, how we have expanded it. We took a very hard look at both of the existing restroom facilities. And we realized it's fairly obvious that they're under capacity. They just don't have enough fixtures. But because there really is no code that regulates how many fixtures you have in a park, uh, we just off top, we just said, listen, let's just double it up, make it um, double the number of fixtures that they currently have. Uh, we did something else. We also put in what we call family rooms. And we have one on the north and one on the south. And so the family room is used as a kind of a catch-all. It's a non-gender, a unisex um, type of a um, space. So anybody could use it. Um, but it does provide um, privacy. It also provides um, an area for like if a parent had a kid that was handicapped and needed some more assistance, they would be able to use that restroom. So it's kind of a catch-all. And then next to that, we've got janitor's closets. Uh, to the left, we've got a concession space. Um, and then below that, we've got a, a storage area for the park itself. You can go to the next slide. So this is a one, one point perspective, as if you cut the, uh, the building in half horizontally, and you're looking down into it. And that, that's the effect that you're looking at. So you can kind of see what's going on inside of the facility. Now, just to the left of all this is that plaza that Donald was talking about. And we really see this whole facility as a multi-function, multi-use space. And all of this, the majority of this is really um, predicated around the point of security. And, you know, when you have a, a public restroom in a park, there's only a couple ways you can make that place secure. A is through audio, meaning whatever happens on the inside, you can hear it on the outside. So if someone was in distress, they would be able to speak out and it would readily be heard. And the other way is to have activities around that zone. Um, and so by having this plaza right there, it's very uniquely uh, located such that it does give you visibility to both of the play areas on the north and the south, which is great. So if a parent is there with their kids and the kids are playing, the parents have a nice place to sit out, hang out, have a cup of coffee, some Danish and, um, you know, and relax. But it also um, speaks to the lake. Uh, as we go to the next slide, you'll start to see what we're talking about. Okay, so here's the canopy in that very large um, a plaza area. And that whole thing opens up to the lake. And looking at the aesthetic for the building, um, we tried very hard to come up with something that really felt like it belonged in Florida. Uh, we try to come up with a, a, a Florida-centric uh, aesthetic, but something that was uh, contemporary, but not so contemporary, it doesn't look like it should belong there in 30 years from now. Um, the materials that we use are very durable. Uh, everything is very hardy. Uh, the wall panels that you see that look like wood, they're actually uh, cementitious panels. Along the top of the facility, you'll see louvers. And so the louvers are doing double duty. They allow air to flow through the facility, but also the acoustics I was talking about before. Uh, so if someone was in distress, you know, they would be readily heard. Um, you've got entrance to the building on either the north and the south. Um, you can go in and out, which is great. You know, again, it makes it really good for people to keep their eyes on what's happening. And the plaza itself, not, it's not just for seating, it also is for activities. Um, you can clear the chairs and the tables. You can have a yoga class out there on a regular basis, a Zumba class. And we think, you know, looking at this this facility at night and the way it's lit up, it almost becomes a beacon, you know, on the eastern edge, eastern edge of the lake. Um, so we feel security was our big thing. And I think we've accomplished that. You can go to the next slide. This just gets you in a little bit closer, um, looking um, west. You can see the entrance going into the restrooms and the other doors and entrance into the uh, storage area in the back. Next slide. Taking you underneath the canopy so you can kind of feel what that atmosphere could look like. 
And again, it's a fairly large space. It's um, somewhat nondescript. We purposely wanted to stay that way so that a lot of different events could happen here. And you could hang banners from the, uh, from the rafters, as it were, um, to um, give note to what's going on at that point. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just another series of imagery to help kind of close out the idea about the play area. This, you'll see some of the larger sculptural pieces that I was describing. You'll see the idea of, you know, using earth forms as play elements. You know, it's, a lot of the play equipment today, the more contemporary pieces are much more um, sculptural and colorful, and we can marry those in concert with kind of a three-dimensional thought about how the the earth form works to really create some pretty exciting play environments. And of course, you know, this would be for all age groups and all, you know, ability levels. So we could make sure that that covers the spectrum. But we're pretty excited about the opportunities, both in, you know, the North and the South play area. Eola Drive is another street that I think we all really love. It's a quaint street. It's got beautiful tree cover over it. We think that it could really play an important role in terms of how it interacts with the park. Uh, you can go to the next slide, I think. And as we, in, in particular, as we think about Robinson Street, which is undergoing some design thought now to maybe reconfigure those lanes to be a, a little bit more pedestrian friendly and bicycle friendly. As that happens, there may be some medians down that, um, down Robinson Street. So it really wouldn't be able to function as we think about it today with tents lining the street and people circulating down the middle. So we thought that Eola Drive could, would really be a great alternative to using Robinson for those kind of activities. So we've, with working within the right of way that we had, we've kind of reproportioned that space. You'll see that we've taken the parallel parking um, off of the sides and put it in the middle with uh, reverse angled parking. We've added wider sidewalks on the east side and a, and a, a shared use path on the, on, the, on the west side. And I think if you go to the next slide, we can see this a little bit better. And then with that big, that big tree canopy there, we've added some, you know, planter islands, which I think will help protect those even more over time. And as, and then when we do have the ability to shut this street down on the north and the south side, you can see how the tents might lay out. So you have a tremendous amount of capacity on this street with the reconfiguration of the street and with um, taking those planted medians um, down to just areas underneath the, the root zone of the tree. So this is a existing cross section. You'll see it's a 67 foot right of way, um, very wide travel lanes for a, a street of this scale, very narrow sidewalks. You, if you've been out there, you've seen that the median is very eroded and compacted where you have the historic trees. So we really wanted to kind of think about how we reallocate the space on the street. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that We've narrowed the travel lanes to hopefully, you know, slow the traffic through that zone and, and, you know, get drivers to behave kind of through that area. You see the reverse angle parking down the middle, the, the dedicated medians, which would be curbed and planted. So that would be overall much better for the, the health of those historic trees and in the middle of the plan. We've added a wider sidewalk on the east side, widening that out to eight feet plus a, a furnishing strip of three. And then on the west side, you'll see the 12 foot shared use path. It helps create a connectivity from north to south in the plan, but also provides that missing link for the, uh, the bike network and the overall city plan. And all that happens within a, the same plane. So we're bringing the roadway up and keeping the sidewalk and the street all within the same plane. So when you do close that for big events, it's much, um, much simpler for pedestrians to kind of make their way and navigate through that space. And you'll see kind of in the background, we've added some stormwater planters, which will create kind of a green street, so a, a, a kind of a mini version of the filtration system for the stormwater that I was describing before, uh, redistributed the lighting, and then added fest festoon lighting, which is overhead lighting, the string lighting over the street to give that space a ceiling. It would be especially nice during event days. And I think if you go to the next slide, we'll see some three-dimensional views of that. So on the left, you'll see kind of a view looking down how the, the back end angled parking would work. And with the reconfiguration of the street and some of the same ideas that you're gonna see on the south side of Eola, we've actually picked up four spaces. So not only do you get a much kind of higher performance street, we've got additional spaces with that reconfiguration. And then on the right side, you're gonna see a view on event day. So you can see how that lays out nicely for vendors. There's lots of room for kind of what I call the back of house for vendors and storing their wares, but lots of room for um, users to kind of circulate freely on both sides. 
So a really nice character street. And we feel like that all those kind of same ideas and concepts could extend to the south side of Eola. Right now, um, there's really no tree canopy to speak of on South Eola. Uh, there's not any parking there. Um, there's no you know, stormwater function there. So we think we can really elevate the performance of that piece of the street as well. Go to the next slide. You'll see, again, this is just illustrating how this works in, in concert with the whole Swan Boat uh, Southeast Quadrant to be extending that festival space so that it all starts to work together as kind of a, a really high intensity activity zone you know, for Eola, the play area, and for that Southeast Quadrant of the park. The existing condition again, you know, for a small roadway, very wide travel lanes, um, very little tree canopy to speak of. There's one large historic tree there very narrow sidewalk. So go to the next slide and you'll see how that was kind of reproportioned. Again, narrowing the travel lanes, additional tree canopy, the LID uh, stormwater basins on the street and the continuation of the shared use path. So that would be contiguous from north to south on the, on the west side. And that, I think the one thing, go back one second, Chiba, the addition of the parallel parking there allows us to think about how we might allow another space for ride share. That might be a great opportunity for handicap proper, parallel handicap parking. That could also be a, an opportunity for um, car charging stations. Go ahead, to next slide. So moving to the Northeast Quadrant, I think as we walk this, we all felt like this is also another big gateway opportunity as you're making your way from the east, west to downtown and you kind of break open to that big view of the lake. So we have the, the kinetic sculpture there. We really wanted to give that a little bit more of an area development plaza. So we've elevated the paving through that corner, added some statement palms on the grid to help direct your view to the fountain and to the lake beyond. And that, as you look at the Robinson Street plan, which we have overlaid within the master plan, you'll see there's a large crossing there. That's for, that's for all Eola Heights and all the neighborhoods to the north. That's what we do, the one of the primary crossings um, within that streetscape plan. So we bring that straight into the plaza and then turn you on axis so you have that big view of the, of the lake and the fountain beyond. And it starts to set up the geometry that you know, keeps this uh, circulation very simple. Um, and yet I think kind of becomes part of the experience of leading you into the park. We've, we know the value of the open space within the park where we've kept the lawn area that everybody loves on the north, this northeast quadrant. We've actually, with the reconfiguration of these walkways made that area a little bit larger You'll notice that we've kept the ting um, as an architectural feature. And we know that was important to people, but one, one thing that we've done there is simplified the boardwalk around it, which is really a very high maintenance and kept it just very simple, kind of keeping the focus on the ting and not so much on the sprawling boardwalk around it. You'll see the leading walks are very deliberately laid out so that as you come into the park, you have that architectural feature at the end with the ting and kind of the lake beyond. So it creates a, a nice framework for that open lawn area on that, on that side. In the center of the plan, where we currently today have the kind of a sprawling duck pond, we really had a, a thought about, you know, that needing the kind of a pre and post function plaza space in this quadrant of the park and under the shade of the canopy of this tree would be a great place to do that. So we've kind of taken that fountain back to a really simple, a simple tiered fountain centering on the sculpture that's out there. It would be a two-tiered fountain with the lower level being a vegetative garden, and then it would cascade down in the lake much like it does today. We've flattened out the pedestrian bridge crossing there so we don't have the ADA issues anymore. But we're excited about this little plaza area that we've created under the canopy of this large historic tree because we know during big events there's a real need for some paved space like this. It's also a big venue for weddings so that you could you'd have a really nice spot within the shade of that tree to set up chairs in a proper way to have um, wedding events there. So we think that's a really nice addition and a nice balance between maintaining the flexible turf open areas, but yet giving a small, comfortable, um, small plaza area that's, that is kind of sorely needed in this part of the park. And then on the peninsula for now, we've kind of kept the peninsula simple. It's a, it's a spot where everybody likes to go out and maybe throw a blanket down. We've kept that just turf but we have added some more palms there to kind of help direct the views into the park. Continuing on to the west, you'll see there's another other, um, biodetention area, the stormwater basin there. This is the area where we also make our way through the more mature cypress canopy, which everybody really loves. It's just fantastic. 
we've really not added a lot of program here. The only thing we've done is, is widened out the promenade so it's a little more user friendly. Let's go to the next slide. So you'll see on the, as you come in from the east, you make your way through the Cypress Grove. And then as you approach, approach Broadway, you'll see on the Robinson Street plan that the intersection of Broadway and Robinson would be a plateaued intersection. That means that intersection would be raised so the pedestrian crossings would be flush with the sidewalk. We've kind of extended that idea of elevating that intersection south into the plan to create a small kind of meet and greet plaza. And then even further into the plan where we have today just a really small boardwalk projection out into the lake. We wanted to really kind of take that to the next level. Since the north side of the plan really doesn't have a lot happening from a program standpoint, we thought this would be a really nice focal point to create a, a true pier that would take you out all the way over the water so you could get out like you, like you can't today completely over the water. And the concept for this pier would be a split seam pier. So there would be multiple elevations. So on the left side, that would break down, take you right down to the water level. So you could get down closer to the water, you could see the swans, you could perhaps have some model boat activities out there. So we really think getting close to the water, uh, that would be a great opportunity. And the right side of the pier, uh, that seam kind of splits and goes up to a higher elevation. And we would add a signature shade structure there. Maybe we could have some bench swings so that you know, from a social activity and kind of a social hub standpoint, that is a really nice extension of the plaza space all the way out into the water for another activity zone on the north side. You continue to the west, you'll see there's another uh, opportunity to break away from the promenade and get out over the lake at the, another one of the stormwater basins. And then I think if you go to the next slide, you'll get through to the, the west restroom and the relax grill. This area, so we've got an, another new restroom or another pavilion uh, that's in the location where it is today. We've, we've deliberately kept it in the same location uh, for a couple of reasons to, make, to you know, take advantage of the infrastructure that's already there. It'd be much easier in terms of utilizing that for the new structure. We've kept a very linear format that Max can talk about in just a second to help screen the, where the parks um, have their headquarters there for the back of house area. So it helps kind of buffer that from the promenade and the lake edge. We've kept the, the small um, maintenance activity or the maintenance uh, drive coming into the lake where there's a small boat ramp. So that's a really functional connection for them that they wanted to keep. But we think we can buffer that a bit from views from the promenade. As you continue to the north, you'll see the relaxed grill. We have some thoughts architecturally about you know, how that might be treated one day to tie into the architectural pattern and vernacular that Max was describing. But at least in plan, we've described you know, the idea of creating a smaller cluster of outbuildings um, that would create a really nice courtyard feel around that historic oak tree in the center there. And then with the relocation of the swan boat venue that was in that really constricted area there we, over to the cove, that allows us to open up that lake edge. We've got a small seating area and then a dining area that right out on the water's edge wrapped by one of the stormwater basins so that you could, if there was a grab and go venue at the, at the um, relaxed grill, you could take your food over and sit right out on the lake edge and enjoy your lunch. And I think if we go to the next slide, Max can talk a little bit more detail about the restroom. Uh, thank you, Donald. Uh, so again, this is one of our earlier sketches of this um, design for the Western West restroom. And one thing you notice, uh, the architecture, the aesthetics between the restrooms are, are fairly close. We did that on purpose. We wanted to kind of create a, a family that was tied together. Now, I will say the amphitheater is completely different and it should be uh, because it really stands alone and it needs to stand out uh, to help really help create a sense of place. But getting back to the restrooms, uh, this linear approach does a lot of different things. It allows us to have a smaller concession on either end of the building and create a nice little seating area outside of that concession. It's a little more intimate, and we think it's really nice because now you are you're starting to pick up even more concessions around and the ability um, for that type of capacity around the lake that you currently don't have. Uh, so this will work and help complement the relaxed grill. Um, now, functionally, the restrooms are pretty much the same. It's just in a uh, linear um, pattern. So we've got a central lobby that you come through underneath the canopy, and you either go into the men's or into the women's. And again, we still have two, an, two entrances or an entrance and an exit. And, and part of the reason why we did that is so that 
if you ever had to do maintenance, and you will in the restrooms, you could shut down a portion of the restroom, lock it off, and still be able to use the other portion of the restroom. So you don't completely shut down a whole section at one time. It gives you a little flexibility. You can go to the next slide. So again, this is one of those one point uh, perspectives that kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view into the building and, and what's happening there. And you can see uh, that's the main lobby going into each of the restrooms. And along the back, you'll see a spine. And that's, the, um, that's where a lot of the utilities are running. That's what we call a wet wall. And you have access to get back in there. Now, when you're doing maintenance, that's very important. The average person probably doesn't care. But you know, we try to set these facilities up so they're functional, functional and easily maintained. You can go to the next slide. So now you're starting to see it in context uh, with Lake, um, the maintenance facility behind it. And if you look real closely, you'll see a triangle. There you go. That's the triangle of the canopy of the existing restroom. So when Donald said we put it fairly close to where the existing is, we put it directly over top of it. So again, so that we can take advantage of the utilities that are already in place. And that same thing happened on the uh, east side as well. You go to the next slide. So you're looking at the uh, canopy that's facing out to the lake. And here's the concession. Uh, with its canopy. Again, this is a much smaller concession. It's a little more intimate. You've got the same thing on either side. And you can see the materials are pretty much the same as on the east side, um, but the architecture is a little different. You can go to the next slide. And there you are looking at the northern end, uh, looking back uh, to the south, where you can see people going in and hanging out at the uh, main entrance. And, people taking advantage of that canopy at the concession area. You can go to the next slide. Moving in a little bit closer, you start to see the materiality that we're using and you know how those panels actually look like wood, but they're, they're really not wood. It's, uh, it's cementitious and the louvers above are metal louvers. So everything here, like I said, is very durable. And we did that on purpose. We want this to last and look good for a very long time. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we're in a, we've got a, a small series here that talk about the promenade and the lake edge. And I think we'll have, we'll be able to go to some question and answer after this. But this series really talks about how do we manipulate the, the lake edge and the promenade and the, the vegetation around the perimeter. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so the, as you know, if you've, most of you experienced the park, I'm sure that the, the sidewalk is it's fairly narrow. It's got the brick edging on it. You'll see a lot of areas where it's rutted and kind of eroded on the side because you really think there just needs to be more capacity, more coherent capacity for that sidewalk, especially as I described earlier. As we continue to urbanize, there's really going to be a need for more space on that primary promenade. And the retaining wall that you see in the middle of the drawing, you know, it's a it's a modular block system. And we we've, we've talked to John and his staff. We know that's a maintenance challenge. We have people throwing them into the lake. So we have some thoughts about how to maybe simplify that a little bit and that which actually helps us deal with both erosion and planting on the on the upland side of that. But also how do we create some littoral zone space on the lake side of that to re, help revegetate the lake? You go to the next slide. So you'll see in this typical cross section, we've widened the promenade out to where we can 15 feet. I mean, Sheba and I have spent a tremendous amount of time kind of scrubbing through the plan, thinking about how we might widen this promenade out, but also thinking about you know, where that might have impacts on root zones of the tree, both cypress trees and oak canopy, all the canopy of the park. So we've been extremely cognizant and sensitive to how we lay out that walkway all, all throughout the park. But this, but we do think that we need a, just a, a wider promenade throughout most of the park plan. In the middle of the drawing, you'll see a much simpler kind of thin concrete blade retaining wall, very easy to construct, very relatively inexpensive, very easy to maintain, and it's very low profile, but it really would be all the, the maintenance and the kind of vandalism of that would essentially go away. 
And it allows us to actually step that wall in a way that helps us deal with the, the filling and the erosion issues on the upland side. And again, create that littoral zone on the south side or on the lake side. Next slide. And where we do, and in a lot of areas around the lake, we have some mature cypress canopy. So we, we would transition that concrete wall into a riprap zone. We can make our way around those trees, not impacting the root zones, but we still get the retaining that we need to help manage the erosion issues that we see. And then we would also revegetate that whole cross section, both on the upland side and the aquatic side to help kind of soften that slope transition. And then just a couple slides here on what I was mentioning in terms of LID or low impact design. You know, we've throughout maybe all of our projects, we've kind of taken a, a, a fundamentally different look of how we think about managing stormwater on sites. And, this project is no different. I think it, in terms of elevating the water quality and improving the water quality, we just have to take a step back and think about, you know, what's the overlay and the intervention that we can have within the existing infrastructure um, within the park, the stormwater infrastructure, to add a layer that would really start to um, uh, make that function at a different level. So how do we, rather than, you know, having a conventional underground pipe system, which I think we're all used to seeing, how do we start to daylight those systems move that stormwater through vegetated zones so that it can do all the things that I was describing to you earlier. And not only do you get a, a system that's much higher performing in terms of you know, increasing the water quality, I think it adds to just the aesthetic and the ecology of the lake. So on the left, you'll see a conventional system of you know, piping to A to B where the stormwater just goes from the street directly into the pond or to the lake and everything that's in that water goes with it. So it really degrades the water um, quality. You look on the right, you get all the benefits of, I was describing earlier, when we send that stormwater into these planted filtration zones, you give the stormwater the ability to perk and recharge the aquifer, you get the ability for plant uptake, you get some filtration through the soil column. All those elements really start to increase the water quality or improve the water quality, hopefully within Lake Eola, and that will just get better over time. And that, you know, not only do these stormwater, LID stormwater basins help to cleanse the stormwater um, that's coming into the park that we think the revegetation of the entire lake edge will add some of those um, the ability to in increase the, the water quality as well, improve the water quality. So this is a cross section through one of the smaller LID basins. You'll see the stone pipe outfalling at the lake edge, the thin concrete kind of curb height wall system that would create that filtration basin. We would control the soil fill there. It would be filled with native plants, predominantly grasses, cypress trees. The stormwater would outfall into that basin, uh, stage up so it, the water would elevate, it would kind of make its way slowly through that vegetated zone and then pop off into the lake in a much kind of cleaner, uh, higher quality water. I think if you go to the next slide, you'll see a, one of the examples of one of the larger zones. Um, it would just be for the, some of the outfalls are much larger than others. So we would kind of size those LID um, biodetention areas accordingly. And in this instance, we actually want to use the structure of that outside of that LID basin as a structure for the boardwalk. So it actually serves double duty. It's creating the envelope that we need for those stormwater basins, but it's also helping to support those uh, boardwalk areas that get you out over the lake edge. Next slide. So uh, with that, I think we're going to take some opportunity to field some questions, and I'm going to turn it back over to Frank. Thanks, Donald. Appreciate it. And remarkably, I remembered to unmute myself because I'm, <laughs> I typically don't. So um, yeah, we did get a handful of questions. We, um, we received, you know, several um, general design comments. Um, and also just again, questions about uh, the plan as Donald and Max have walked through it. So let me, let me start by the most common one, which is, um, uh, we received several comments about and several questions about was the one that I think we expected the most, which is what's the timing and what's the cost. So uh, first of all, let me just say that when we were retained to do the master plan, um, we, you know, the city told us, and, and we certainly agreed that we wanted to be as forward thinking as possible. Um, no restrictions. Let's just really kind of dream out of the box as much as possible. And that's really what master plans are for. Um, and so we did that. Um, I don't think there's any intent on the part of the city uh, to take this entire master plan and create a single project and build it all at once. I just think it's just too much, um, too high a cost. 
I think the reality is that what, what's going to happen is that individual pieces and parts in the future will be um, redesigned, redeveloped, reconstructed into what you're seeing now as the master plan. Uh, we are, our next step actually after this is to um, begin to develop some detailed cost estimates. And what we won't do is one cost again for the entire park. Uh, we're gonna sit down with John and his folks and talk about what are um, sort of reasonable pieces um, that make the most sense to think about being constructed, you know, as a single individual component part. For example, you know, the amphitheater, um, the promenade behind the amphitheater and the plaza seems to make sense as potential, a single potential project. Uh, the playgrounds, um, the Swan Beach, that Max's restroom building, the interactive, that might be, a, 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 that's a reasonably good sized project, but certainly uh, could be one that we would think about doing estimates for and potentially at some point having it constructed. We've talked to, to um, John and his folks and, and really what may be one of the first things to happen um, are the individual restrooms. I know that they certainly, what's out there now, really need to be upgraded. Um, Max's designs are fabulous. There's at least double the amount of fixtures, which is gonna be helpful. So um, that's also under consideration. So timing, probably, several years out um, for completion and um, cost-wise is something that we're going to begin to work on actually right after this. Um, one question we got was, will the back of the band shell be illuminated? I think in the presentation, it certainly looked like that. And then along with that, will the promenade behind the amphitheater be illuminated? And so I'll answer the second part of that question, which is yes. Um, the promenade will certainly be illuminated. A master plan doesn't really get into selecting fixtures and talking about too much about you know, that level of detail, but certainly we think as the park is upgraded, we would upgrade the lighting system um, throughout the park, um, for, certainly for safety, and that, that component piece behind the amphitheater would be a part of that. Um, Max, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe you know, the existing uh, amphitheater that you showed in the renderings, which all appeared to be upgraded and illuminated, as well as maybe the illumination of the new canopy that's proposed. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Yeah, I, that's a very good question. Uh, we do think illumination lighting is going to be a vital part of the uh, success of this design. And so, you know, the band shell itself will be illuminated. We're going to add new, new LED lights to the shell. Uh, so it really kind of pops and stands out. Uh, and you're going to see that, that that'll be on every night. The canopy that's covering the stage, that's going to have theatrical lighting that's built into it, as well as just general illumination of the, um, of the uh, canopy itself, as well as audiovisual uh, components so that you can uplight the canopy and also downlight the canopy uh, to give a little more interaction. And um, because we really see Lake Eola as the as the anchor, not like you, we see the band shell as the anchor uh, through the whole lake. And it really needs to be center stage. So I think the lighting is going to help promote that. Uh, there's gonna be lighting underneath the canopy on the west. So this whole thing is gonna light up, be controlled, and be able to react to different performances and different things that are gonna be going on in that area. I hope that answers. Thank you, Max. Sure. Yep. That's great. Thank you so much. Let me throw another one at you because it's regarding the restrooms. Um, any chance that there could be a system where they, they could be auto sort of auto washed on a daily basis so they're kept clean? Is that a possibility? Yes, that's a possibility. Um, you know, anything's a possibility if you're willing to pay for it. So. <laughs> I just didn't know if you had seen the system like that. I have. I have. They have that over in Europe and different European countries uh, do that on a regular basis. Typically, it's done on smaller restrooms, not one of this size of capacity. So we, we'd have to give it some thought. But honestly, the way it's designed, uh, a person would be, a maintenance person would be able to go in there with a power sprayer spray and spray the whole thing down on the inside. Because uh, again, we're trying to keep robust uh, materials that are very easily maintained. And I know the exterior of the building is the same way with cementitious yes. materials that it can be washed down, hosed down. It's very, very, they are very, very durable the way that they've been. Yes, designed. absolutely. Um, and 
Okay, another question. Have the swans and geese approved the new plan for their hangout spaces? I can tell you that we attempted to present to the swans and geese, but they don't understand. <laughs> so we're looking for a translator. Um, but seriously, I mean, they were taken into consideration in terms of the, the Swan Beach and the feeders and really the ecology of the park, as you can see, as Donald has walked through, has, has really been a large component piece of what has been done. Um, I don't think he touched on it and it's a very minor detail, but it's sort of the level of detail that we've gone to in the design of the park at the terraced seating area. I don't know if you all noticed, but there are two logs. They were actually would be faux logs um, fake, but it probably made of concrete to look like a log. But the reason is we know that people sit out in that space now and like to just look at the birds and look at the turtles. The turtles are constantly nesting there as well. And that's why they are there. So we've even taken the turtles into consideration in the overall design. Um, another question, are there any thoughts of a pedestrian bridge over Robinson Street? I don't know who, well, I'll take a shot at it. I, I am not aware that there are any plans that exist for that right now. The new design of Robinson Street, which is, a, which is indicated on this master plan, it is not something that we designed, but another consultant did, um, which puts the medians uh, um, down Robinson Street. And then as you can actually see here, Chiba, if you could point to it um, right in the center of Robinson where it, you would cross and head to the pier, that is an elevated intersection it's table topped, so it strengthens that pedestrian connection. Uh, that is, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Robinson Street is a state road. So that would be a DOT funded project, not a, not a city project. John, is that, that is correct, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay, so that would more be a question for uh, the Department of Transportation, um, but we are not aware, and John, I don't know that you would be aware that there's any plans to go over Robinson Street. I know there was talk about it earlier, but it was not in this area. It was in the, more in the downtown area. But I think that um, so far that has not been a, a, a winning uh, proposition. Hey, Frank, if I could chime in for one second on that sure. as well. You know, being a resident of Yole Heights and it, having to cross that street, I've been, I've had firsthand experience with that. But I think, and I know, you know, how that could be a, you know, a little bit challenging with the configuration today, but you'll see with the, reduction to you know one lane in either direction and the planted medians, the narrowing of the drive lanes. It's much like I was describing on EOLA. I think there's a series of, of, of kind of reconfiguration strategies there in addition with the planting of that street that'll help slow the traffic on that. And then you know controlling the pedestrian crossings, actually having proper ramps, you know, elevating visually where those pedestrians cross, all those things will make those crossings from the neighborhoods to the north to EOLA much safer and much easier. Thanks, Donald. Um, next question. Are there any plans to accommodate the recently announced Orlando Land Trust property on the southwest corner? Shiva, can you point to that piece of property? And, and for those who don't know, um, a, a group called the Orlando Land Trust has purchased that building. That is where the 7-Eleven is and the remainder of that building um, with the intent to turn it into a public open space. Um, we have had conversations about it. It is not a part of this project. Um, I can also tell you that as important as that piece is, it doesn't directly connect to the park, but it would be an important component piece of open space within the downtown. I mean, in the future, who knows what the disposition of the adjoining buildings might be and whether it would be wonderful if there was a connection and that became a significant gateway into Weola Park. Um, but the, the property that they will be controlling now, once that building is removed, doesn't make that connection. John, do you want to talk at all about the future design of that? You want to mention that? John, you're muted. There you go. Yeah, there yeah. You go. They, um, we are looking at that. Uh, we are going to be uh, going out to a consultant, of course, to uh, to work on that, and. Um, the folks that were involved with the purchase of that property will, will have some uh, say in it, but it is gonna be a city park. And, uh, and um, so it'll be similar in the, um, the visioning 
of, of the elements of that where uh, everything has a purpose and everything's gonna look well together. It will uh, probably echo some of the design component components that you'll see in the, uh, in the design of the uh, of EOLA's master plan, uh, but just not will not be a physical connection at this time. So uh, we look forward to working on that. And I hope that, um, that we come, I know we will come up with something uh, again, very uh, intriguing and, uh, and, and it'll have to work in that spot, which is gonna be very nice when you think about it, that entire intersection has uh, is, uh, uh, got a lot of potential. It does. Very good, thank you, John. Okay, next question just came in. Is the pagoda going away? It looks old and worn. And that is what uh, Donald during the presentation mentioned as the Tang, it is known as the Tang. It is, it is not going away. Um, although the area around it, the decking around it would be removed and replaced with something a little bit uh, more simple that doesn't detract from the, at least in my opinion, beauty of the Tang. Most folk, in fact, Donald, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know that we heard anyone in all the public meetings that we had that said that they did not like the Tang. We did hear that it needed an upgrade, um, but it is, is certainly a part of the plan in the future. That's right. Another question, are the C, C Orlando art pieces to remain? And the simple answer to that is yes. Um, we have accommodated those pieces in the plan. I, I know that Donald touched on some of them. Um, Sheba is pointing to one right now on Central, which will remain. You know, there's the one on the corner of uh, Eola and Robinson to remain. There's one as you come in from Thornton Park on the angled entrance mm -hmm. uh, towards the towards the cove that would remain. So yes, the intent is not to eliminate them or move them. And then um, what's the most common feedback we heard about any issues facing the park? So I can tell you um, if my memory serves, and it usually doesn't, but I do remember that most folks certainly felt like the park, it was time for an upgrade and a refresh as much as they love the park, and people really do love the park. Um, it is time for an upgrade. So they, I think they think that creation of the master plan is something that's very timely. We heard a little bit about ecology um, and water quality, which I think we've done our best to address. John, maybe this is something that you could answer because you probably through the years have heard more um, about any potential issues facing the park. Anything else that you wanna add? No, well, actually, I, I think you've hit on all the uh, elements. I mean, for you even started off the entire presentation talking about maintenance and then the circulation around the park uh, on the widened path. Uh, the fact that you guys did an excellent job of uh, taking it on the uh, east side of the, uh, the amphitheater, the back, what we call the back side of the amphitheater and, 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 and uh, bringing people closer to the water, I think was excellent. It was always, uh, to go around the other side was always kind of uh, uh, where it is now is very hot. It's um, you get closer to the traffic there, and there's and sometimes if you went, if you took the widened path through the middle, uh, you felt like you were um, in an area that you shouldn't be in, especially if there was a an event going on in the amphitheater. So, um, so I think that along with the the improved water quality, I thought that uh, you know moving the um, Swan Dock. To the other side of the lake is going to be not only better for the uh, for the folks that are enjoying that particular amenity, uh, but to see that going on, it'll be like almost 270 degree view of that lagoon, and you know you can actually jump out on that point there and wave to people as they they float off in the uh, swan boats, and I just think it's going to be a really neat. Uh, change for that area. And then um, coming around the backside of the uh, Eola house and the area there where, where there's room for a tent is awesome. The increased area, and you're, you were correct in stating that uh, some of that area north of the existing restroom there is unused space. It's nice and shady, but it is unused. 
And we are gonna keep that shade canopy and we're going to introduce some more play pieces there. You, you did a good job of, uh, of increasing some of the open space in the park where I thought there wouldn't be room to do that. And so uh, kudos for all of those things and then maintaining a widened path on the rest of the park. You guys hit all the elements that we were looking for. Thank you, John, appreciate that. Um, question, Max, uh, regarding architecture, what is the material of the canopy and what is the anticipated lifespan, lifespan of that material before it needs to be replaced? And I'm assuming that the canopy, by canopy, um, Ms. Walker means the um, canopy at the amphitheater, both the one over the turf seating area and the one by the stage. Uh, the material of the canopy is the appropriated metal panel. Uh, it could end up becoming aluminum uh, just so it has a longer lifespan. And that's going to be over a structural steel frame, which is tied back into a, a concrete um, base or foundation. Um, we think it should last until you're ready to change it again, which could be 20 or 30 years out without any problem. And uh, so we don't see any issues with that. And, and keep in mind, part of the canopy, part of the function of the canopy is not to be a structure to um, cover you or keep you out of the elements. Because if there is a performance going on, we really don't want you out there in the elements. Uh, you just, you know, still a chance of lightning. It's really to provide shade. And that's why it's perforated. And I will think it'll do an adequate job, more than an adequate job of making that happen. Great. Thank you, Max. Sure. Another question just came in. Will there be an opportunity for new art installations to be added within the new plan? Um, I certainly think there's opportunity for, for new art installations, not knowing exactly what they are. It's a little difficult to determine what the best location within this plan would be. Um, but I would assume, and, and again, I, I keep throwing everything to John, but he represents, he's such a lucky guy, he represents the city. Um, <laughs> Um, I would imagine that the city um, certainly has an appetite for additional large art pieces if someone wants to do that. John, you want to clean that answer up for me? I think you did a good job. I, I, I think appetite for it is the right uh, verb, uh, the right, right description for that. Uh, the city certainly is, uh, you know, uh, shown that it's uh, willing and able to uh, introduce art in the downtown area when they when they feel like they need it and then that there's a, a good process for gaining it and I think that'll continue. Great, thank you sir. Um, next question, will we have similar fountains somewhere else in the lake where the cove is going to go? Um, trying to sort of understand the question. I know that there are you know, there are some fountain bubblers in that space right now on either side of the bridge. And, and maybe the question is, you know, if, if that turns into, you know, a location for the swan boats, are there gonna be other fountain installations maybe that would move to another place and within the lake? And the answer to that is not, I don't, I don't believe that would be the case. Um, if the question is whether or not those fountains are going to remain in the cove, my guess would be probably not in their current location because of the swan boats that are going to be coming and going. So my guess would be you probably won't have the fountain within the cove. You know, the other thing is that the cove, particularly once the bridge is gone, is such a beautiful natural environment that I'm not so sure, and this is sort of an opinion, it's not so sure that, that I, I wouldn't rather just see the natural beauty of that space. Donald, anything you want to add maybe to that? No, I mean, I would tend to agree. I mean, part of taking down the bridge in that cove is to really to open up, like you just said, and kind of express the, the natural beauty there and revegetate that lake edge. So, and just functionally, I don't think you'd be able to have the water feature there with the swan boats coming and going. You know, we, as we do have the new water features that you see in the plaza near the amphitheater, a smaller one at the Festival Street on the Washington Street extension the interactive fountain, and then just the reconfiguration of the duck pond. So, you know, I feel like there's a good balance of, you know, places within the plan to be able to interact with water in different ways, be it just view it or touch it. Um, we think there's an opportunity for that kind of throughout the plan, and as well as the Sperry Fountain. Great. Thank you, sir. I hope we answered that correctly. Um, 
we're getting very low on time, but very quickly, let me let me let me throw this question out that we just well actually we just got two. So hang, bear with me, everybody. Um, yeah, there's a question about can we touch again on the relaxed grill? You know, it is a well, um, it's a city-owned building, but there is an operator within that building. Is there any intent to to kind of redo that building and refresh it as well? Um, only in as much for this plan for for our design only in as much as in plan view um, and and addressing some of the design changes to the plan that would then feed the patio across the way and have a sort of a little grab and go spot that doesn't exist necessarily today but in terms of revising and, and revamping the architecture john i don't know that that's a decision that's been made yet um, can you touch on that for us Sure. Well, you know, one of the reasons for the uh, master plan is so that if there are improvements or renovations that are made in the park, they will match what we have uh, come up with as the guidelines in the master plan. So that when there is a need for renovation uh, uh, as an agreement between who, the contractor that or the vendor that is there now and the city of Orlando, they will need to meet those guidelines. Great, thank you, sir. Um, we've got time maybe for one more and it is, will there be artificial turf under the rear amphitheater shade structure? We've talked about it. Um, shading is gonna be a challenge for the turf under there. Uh, Donald, do you wanna talk about it at all? I don't know that we've made a decision, but. No, I think the intent for that, for that would be artificial turf. You know, I think real sod under there would be tough to maintain, especially if hopefully as you know, venues continue to increase there, it would be a challenge with just the wear and tear on that. I think True. long term, I think artificial turf is the way to go. You know, the, those turfs in terms of the technology and the comfort, durability of those and the ability to maintain them have come so far. It's, it's really a great product. And especially when you can get it in the shade, I think it would be really kind of exactly what we envision for that upper level of seating. Agreed. All right, sir. Thank you. Um, folks, we are right on schedule and out of time for the Q&A. So let me turn it over to Shiva real quick, Shiva. Sure, thank you everyone for joining us. We just wanna remind you that we're, you're gonna have at least one more opportunity to uh, participate in this process. We will be wrapping up the final master plan by the end of this summer. So please stay connected to the website orlando.gov forward slash EOLA plan so that you can see uh, the updates and um, you know stay connected to the conceptual master plan and the final master plan. Um, if if after this uh, meeting something comes up uh, and you you know there's a question you're you know really want to uh, ask, please contact uh, Tara Rusikov with your questions um, so that a week so that she can um, send those questions to the design team. Um, so we just look forward to um, your part continued participation. Thank you so much for participating today. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to John. Thank you, Shiva. And um, I won't go back over all of the information because it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Orlando gov forward slash EOLA plan is the place to go. I really appreciate everyone attending today. I especially uh, want to thank all of our panelists and the people behind the scenes that are helping make this possible by clicking buttons and getting all the, all the right phone numbers and so on. I know it's a lot of work and thank you, Susan, for your part in that. Uh, our community solutions group uh, panelists are, are fantastic. They've been working really hard on this and I thank them. But mostly I thank the citizens of Orlando, the people that are here on this call, and also the ones that have participated. I urge you to continue to participate, continue to answer, the, to uh, give us questions online, uh, watch what's going on. Uh, this, I believe that this uh, presentation is gonna be online so that you can uh, watch it again or have maybe someone who has not seen it yet to uh, pull it up and, and see a, a uh, recording of this presentation. So that's going to be good. And I look forward to uh, all the next steps that uh, Frank and Sheba mentioned that we're going to be going into next. So, 
Thank you all very much. Yes, appreciate thank you it. For your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care.